We are here this evening to discuss men and women of the book. Wendell has given me the time, and we want to spend these minutes with you in the very best way we can. I think of two passages tonight. Uh, I'd rather be a preacher than a college president, and I'm glad to be a gospel preacher. And I'm glad to use whatever talents I may have at Lipscomb in presiding over the activities, but my life is in preaching the gospel. I've spent a great deal of my life in preaching. And I want you boys here in the school of preaching to believe that being a gospel preacher is as fine a work as you can engage in here on earth. I respect elders, and I respect elders who are backing great preachers. And I want to say that I want young men today to believe they're going into the greatest work when they're going into preaching the gospel and telling the story of Jesus Christ. If I had my life to live over, I'd want to be a preacher. I have enjoyed it. I would not take anything for the friends I've made across this land and in different parts of the world. I wouldn't take anything for the memories I have. Our people have walked down the aisle to say I'd like to be baptized into Christ as I've engaged in preaching. We need men and women of the book. Acts chapter 2. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' teaching, in fellowship, in the breaking of bread, and in prayers. And I like Second Timothy chapter 3, all scripture given by inspiration of God. We believe scripture, the Bible, the word of God is inspired. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable. And you know the words used in describing how profitable it is. And I take these two passages because we believe we need to continue in the Word of God. And we believe the Bible is inspired that men could not have written the Bible. And with this faith, we beg for men and women of the book. David Lipscomb College campus is located in a beautiful residential section in Nashville, Tennessee. It is there because years ago, a man named David Lipscomb and his wife, Aunt Mag, decided to give their farm to a Bible school. The Lipscomb Bible School began 1891, and it moved to the present campus in 1903. David Lipscomb did not have living children. He had one son who died as a young man. They could have given this land to nieces and nephews. But I challenge you this evening to say that I believe David Lipscomb did something better with his land than in giving it to nieces and nephews. He gave it as a piece of ground where the Bible might be taught daily. And David Lipscomb put in the deed to that farm. It was to be used for a school. And that so long as that land was used for a school, the Bible must be taught daily to every student. This is unique. This is distinctive. Bible taught every day to every student. And if you come to Lipscomb, even if you're 60 years of age, if Hugo McCord should enroll at Lipscomb, we'd make him take a Bible class every day. <laughs> And this is unique. So far as we know, we have the largest daily Bible program on the campus of Lipscomb that we know of in the United States of America. We have 3,694 students this year, kindergarten through four years of college, and each student enrolled there with more than one course, every student has a class in the Bible every day. We do not know of a larger daily Bible program in America than we have in Nashville, Tennessee, because David Lipscomb said, daily Bible study. And he said in that deed, if this farm or land is sold and that this property and this money is used to buy the property, it is encumbered upon the new purchase 
that a daily class in the Bible must be offered, and therefore we're glad for it. And I'm glad to have a part in saying we want to teach the Bible daily. And tonight, let me read you what the man said about teaching the Bible. Notice the importance of it. And I think these words are more important now than any time of my life. The supreme purpose of the school shall be to teach the Bible as the revealed will of God to man and as the only and sufficient rule of faith and practice. That's great. But he said, notice this, and to train those who attend in pure Bible Christianity. What does that mean? Excluding from the faith all opinions and philosophies of men. Isn't that great? Not enough just be positive. Must be some ex must be some excluding done. Excluding from the faith all opinions and philosophies of men and from the work and worship of the church of God, all human inventions and devices. It is enough just to preach singing is right and scriptural. David Lipscomb said, you teach them that the use of mechanical instruments is wrong. So I repeat this. The supreme purpose shall be to teach the Bible as revealed will of God to man, and as the only and sufficient rule of faith and practice, to train those who attend in a pure Bible Christianity must live right, have the right kind of environment, excluding from the faith all opinions and philosophies of men, and from the work and worship of the Church of God, all human inventions and devices. And then he said, such other branches of learning may be added, as will aid in the understanding and teaching of the Scriptures, and as will promote usefulness and good citizenship among men. Teach them how to live, teach them how to make a living, teach them how to live, teach them how to live upon this earth, and prepare them for heaven. Upon this basis, we believe it's right to stand you tonight and say, yes, David Lipscomb, yes, Luke, yes, Paul, today we need men and women of the book. And I'm glad that David Lipscomb College has this daily Bible program because we're trying to produce men and women of the book. Thank you for the subject. And consequently, we're working at it seven days in the week to train men and women of the book in this daily Bible teaching program. It costs us about $700,000 a year to do it, just in teaching the Bible at Lipscomb. Students pay two-fifths of the cost. They, we charge two hours tuition, we give them five hours training and teaching. And so it costs us extra above what the students pay, about $700,000 a year to have this daily Bible program. You say, where in the world do you spend so much money? Well, a part of it is electricity. You know what Lipscomb's electric bill was October through the middle of November, a month? 31000 so many hundred dollars for one month. If you fuss about your bill, let me give you mine. <laughs> In addition to electricity, our gas bill to heat the water, heat the room, gas bill, one month recently, just a recent month, $21,000, two items, electricity and gas for one month, a little over $52,000. A great number of these classes are Bible classes where we furnish the teacher and we furnish the electric and we furnish the room, and we heat the room, and we air condition the room, $52,000 a month. Why? We're doing it because we're trying to train men and women of the book as we work with Christian parents and with loyal congregations in training. May I make six pleas? You know, one job here is to fit in the book what I say with what I say up here. When I was a child, I used to love sorghum, molasses, butter, and biscuit. 
and I could never make it come out even. I'd, I'd use that excuse. I'd sop the sorghum and the butter and I'd wind up and have no biscuits. I'd get more biscuits. And then when I ate the biscuits up, I had some sopping left. So I'd get more biscuits, more sorghum and more butter. Did I enjoy breakfast with sorghum and butter? Now I eat honey every morning I'm home. Turn from sorghum to honey. Every morning I have to have oatmeal and honey. Uh, Brother Barney Moorhead lives in Nashville. He's 84 now. He's a member of Granny White, where I am. Barney is now called Two Ton Barney. He's on his second ton of honey. Literally. He has willed his body to Vanderbilt Hospital with the instructions when I die. Examine my body and show the world that eating honey will make you live a long time and it will keep you from having bad colds. He's on his second ton. He used to buy 60 pounds at a time. He eats honey every day. He's now 84. I've been eating it several years. I'm not 84 yet, but I'm on the way and I'm eating that honey. If you hear I've got a bad cold, you know my theory's failed. I've been going a few years now and haven't had much cold. I pick on wood. Eating honey and oatmeal make you live a long time, and that I've drank buttermilk every night when I'm home. Isn't that a combination? <laughs> buttermilk every night, oatmeal and honey every morning, live a long time and feel good. Well, next time you come, Frank, let's ride one on my bicycle. That'll break my leg. I don't like that. <laughs> now, the six pleas I'd like to make as we think about men and women of the book and living right and staying in good health and doing that which is right and honorable. And I'll try to tie in some of the things in the book that I sent out here with some of the things I want to say tonight. These pleas that I'd like to make. Members of the Church of Christ, in view of the message of Acts 2, in view of the message of 2 Timothy 3, should try to be the best informed Bible students of any so-called religious group in the world. Right. Here we say, speak where the Bible speaks, be silent where it's silent. Now I love that. Call Bible things by Bible names. I like that. Do Bible things in Bible ways. I like that. Men and women of the book, members of the Church of Christ should really try to be the best informed people on the Bible of any religious group so-called in the world. Why not? I saw this at Old Hickory, Tennessee years ago. I was glad I lived there that I was living in a young church. And when people would be transferred to Old Hickory, members of the church without being told would take their Bibles and go and find out where their membership might have been to see their members of the church. And if they were not, they went to work. They believed, those members of Old Hickory, that it was right to follow Christ, be a member of his church, to wear the name Christian, and to live right. And they went to work on their neighbors. And we baptized people then. The biggest meeting of any one place, any one congregation I've ever had in my life is Old Hickory. Twelve days, 111 baptized because we had a congregation backing us, backing us in daily teaching of the Word. And I think it'll work now. We believe if we have 500 members who are trying to convert neighbors with open Bibles and teaching, not because they're on any kind of team, but because they're Christians. If you're on a team, that's wonderful if you want to be. But you're Christians and you're working and you're begging up window and Hugh Fulford, and these are the preachers with open Bible teaching. You know it. You know what to teach. You teach it, and you do a good job. I have seen it work. I believe in it now. Now, then, when the preacher and the elders and the members work together as men and women of the book, you can convert people. I know it's maybe harder now, but it can still be done. But I'm pleading tonight that you take the lead as leaders here, that you women take the lead as wives, mothers, 
as relatives of young people, that you men as preachers and elders take the lead, that all of us may say, we are going to try to convert people more and more this year. We want to be men and women of the book, and let's study it. My second plea, you need to love the book enough that you want to have family devotion every day. I won't embarrass you, but I imagine many of you could not hold your hand up tonight if I should ask to hold your hand up if you have daily family devotion. Do you love the Bible? Are you a man and woman of the book enough that you want to take the book and use it day by day with your family? Hugh Fulford's here. I think of Homer Jakes, one of the elders where Hugh preaches. I call him Buttermilk Elder. That goes back to my buttermilk. I drank him out one night. <laughs> I was there in a meeting. We drank up all the buttermilk they had. And Homer knew I drank buttermilk, and he drinks it too. But that night, they didn't have much buttermilk, and Homer drank sweet milk. He forced it down. And I still drank them out. And Homer just finally said, now, preacher, just stop. That's all we've got. I didn't even drink my buttermilk tonight so you could have it. Quit. <laughs> I've called him buttermilk Jakes ever since. But during a meeting at Shovelville, Sister Jake saw me last year when I was there again. Years ago, you came and preached on family devotion. Homer and I started then. We had two small children. We started then in having daily family devotion, and we have followed it through all the years. And she said, may I tell you what this has meant to our family, men and women of the book. At Central Church in Miami, Florida, I met the Browns. When the meeting started many years ago, one of the meetings, Mrs. Brown was the only member of the church in the entire family. During the meeting, the husband was baptized, the son and daughter, his young people, were baptized. When I came back to Nashville, Sister Brown wrote and said, Monday night after the meeting, my husband took the Bible and said, we want to have a family period of worship. She said, this was the first time, of course, since I married, and I just wanted to write and tell you that we met last night and read the Bible, and he led us in prayer for the first time in our married life. We asked the son and the daughter to participate, and she said it was wonderful. Several years ago, I met on the Lipscomb campus with J.P. Sanders, Batsa Barrett Baxter, and some others. We were beginning a new magazine. We were trying to name it. I believe it was J.P. Sanders who told this story, and from this story we named the magazine. He said he knew of two businessmen. One had a big business and a friend of his, another businessman came by to see him. And the first businessman said, I want you to go to my power room. The other man said, I'll be glad to go. He was expecting to see some big dynamos of some kind, or big mortars. The first businessman climbed a stairway, and the second businessman was behind him. He went up to the head of the stairs, and he opened the door to a small room. Inside the room, the two men looked, and the businessman, the visitor, looked, and there was one table, one chair, and a Bible on the table. The businessman said, this is my power room. I come here every morning to read the Bible every business day. I'm here. I read the Bible, and I get down on my knees and pray. Here I receive power for the day. And we name the magazine Power for Today, the Family Devotion Magazine. It came from that story of the two businessmen. Do you have a power room at your house? We want you to be men and women of the book where you read the book, pray to God of the book, where you really have a family devotion. Yes, I want you to really be men and women of the book, where you are known as members of the Church of Christ, the best informed group on the Bible of any group in the world. I want you to be men and women of the book to love it enough to have a family devotion. I want you to be men and women of the book enough to live it. Find out more truth day by day and live it. 
What is happening to churches of Christ? <coughs> May I tell you a true story? I'm talking about living. Acts 2, and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' teaching. Men and women of the book want to live it. Up is this man in Nashville carried me to lunch just a few weeks ago. Yes, Batsel Baird Baxter to go with us. The three of us sat at a table in the city club there on top floor on the banks. We looked out over the Nashville skyline and this man said, I want to know what is happening to churches of Christ. He said, I've been a member since boyhood. He said, the late C. M. Pullius baptized me into Christ many, many years ago. He said, something is happening. This man is now 74 years of age. He is still very active in the church. But he said, something is happening. It's different. He said, I went down to Franklin, Tennessee. I'll call the name of the town. Just a few weeks ago, I met a member of the church. He's old. He was in poor health. His wife was in poor health. And I said, why don't you sell this big house and move to an apartment? And the man said, I can't because my son is living with his unmarried wife here. And I can't move them out. And this man said, do you mean to tell me that you, a member of the church, are, that you are allowing your son to live in your house with a woman? He is not married to her. He is there living here. And the man said, yes. I don't know what else to do. And this man said... I can show you the church roll. This man's name is on it. His wife's name's on it. What is happening to the church? He said, I looked up about two Sundays ago. I saw a man serving at the Lord's table. And he said, I know that man. And many of the congregation know him as one of the men who will not pay his on his debts. And that's his reputation. What is happening to the church of Christ? What is your answer? Don't we need more discipline as men and women of the book? What is happening? We need men and women of the book who are willing to live it. Who are willing to stand for it. I'm asking you, what is happening to the Church of Christ? A fourth plea I'll make this evening. We live in a world where many are turning to the tube, television, for recreation, for knowledge. Many people have quit reading. Many members of the Church have just about quit reading, and they're just watching. We need to be men and women of the book enough that we're going to have a regular plan of Bible study, a chapter a day, so many minutes a day, a regular plan. And you need to encourage your young people to have a regular plan of study. And you need to encourage them to attend the right kind of schools where the Bible can be studied. You need to take them to Sunday school Sunday morning where the Bible can be studied, and you need to let them hear faithful preachers where the Bible is preached. I believe that it will still work. Three of us are here this week from Lipscomb. I'm here, of course. Tom Holland will be here this week. Director of our preacher training, Rubel Shelley, is here. He, we have signed the contract with Rubel. He begins full-time with us in September. Somebody asked me, what direction is Lipscomb taking? I said, Tom Holland, Rubel Shelley. That's the direction. <laughs> we have just employed Howard Horton on a full-time basis. He has seven more years before time of retirement. Howard B. is with us this year as a missionary in residence. He'll begin with us full-time on a permanent basis next fall. Howard Horton, Rubel Shelley, Tom Holland. We're trying to set the course of action. 
We are going to build men and women of the book, the Lord being our helper. And we're employing these people who are well trained, who are known as sound teachers. We are having them come to say, and I'm telling them, listen, we want you to go at this in earnest way. May I tell you something of things that are happening. In Nashville, Tom Holland preaches for Creve Hall. Interest rates are high, yes. Inflation's running rampant, yes. But the elders at Creve Hall saw they had a building running over. Tom has been there now in his third year. Building running over. And last Sunday, they opened a new 1,200-seat auditorium. They said, we won't wait for interest to go down. We're going to build it. We won't wait for inflation to die. It may never die. We're going to build it and save souls. They took up one or two special contributions, and they built a beautiful 1,200-seat auditorium. Last Sunday, Tom preached to 1,601, and they're starting two services in their new building Sunday. Rubel Shelley is preaching for the Ashwood congregation. On Sunday night, Rubel is just going through the Bible, taking it as it comes, going through the Bible Sunday by Sunday. He'll have between four and 500 college students there, plus all the adults, and they're now having two Sunday evening services to accommodate the crowds. He's studying the Bible. Two Sunday morning services, Two Sunday evening services now, one at four. Is that too early? Somebody said, man, that's unscriptural. <laughs> four o'clock first service, and then the second service follows. I believe people want good preaching, straight Bible preaching in love. They want to exclude from the faith opinions and philosophies of men. People hear that all the time on television, on the tube. They're tired of it. They hear about murder. They hear about rape. They hear about all these robberies. They listen to the tube where homosexuality is made popular, where living together, sleeping together is made popular before marriage. And I believe people are hungry for the great principles of the Bible. And that Tom Holland and Rubel Shelley and Wendell Winklers and these people, that people, if they'll preach it in love and preach it firmly and say, this is right and stress it, this is wrong and show why, this territory, I'm telling you about Ashwood. I'm telling you about Tom and Rubel. The same thing can be done, I know, in this country, a great country. I do not plan to fold my hands and give in to Satan. The Joelden Church in Davidson County is leading in the cleanup TV campaign. They're having an impact. Time Magazine has recognized them. Newsweek has recognized them. Interviews have been conducted on NBC television. They're being recognized. On CBS this morning, you have first to tell. This is a good move. People want righteousness exalted, many of them. I close in these closing moments by telling you the word must is still in my Bible. Acts 16, what must I do to be saved? When I say men must die, women must die, that means without exception. Unless the Lord comes in our lifetime, we must die. The question is, what must I do to be saved? If I should try to remove Wendell's gallbladder tonight, I would kill him. I have never had the training a man or a woman must have to be a surgeon. I would kill him. The word is must. Men and women of the book believe 
that obedience is essential. The grace of God is wonderful. Obedience is essential. And you must obey. You must hear the word. You must obey it to be saved. God is depending upon us to carry the message and to encourage obedience. I don't care if some people may call a person like me a paper pope. That doesn't bother me. I don't believe it. But I believe in the message on the paper. I believe the message on the pages of the Bible. And I'm glad I had a mother who taught me to love the Bible. And I appreciate T.B. Larimore, whose grandmother was sweeping the trash into the open fire one day. He saw her reach down and pick up a page of paper. And he said, Grandma, why didn't you sweep the old page in the fire? And she said, Son, I saw it was a page from the Bible, and I could not sweep God's word into the fire. 